In architecture school in America, you're lectured on Frank Lloyd Wright. He's the most important American architect, really probably of, certainly of the 20th century. And part of the lecture, they talk about these special building blocks, they call Froebel blocks. The Froebel blocks were part of a system of educational toys designed by this fellow Friedrich Froebel, who was a German educator in the early 19th century, who created kindergarten single-handedly. What I find fascinating about the Froebel kindergarten methodology is that it really no longer exists in early childhood, but it's alive and well in the design schools and the universities. A lot of professors of architecture are now using these materials to educate their undergraduate and graduate students in design. The global system I liked for a lot of reasons. One, it, it had connections to art and design via Wright and other people. Uh, two, it had a concrete repertoire of things that you could play with and use so that it was grounded. And the interesting thing about the Froebel gifts is that they kind of implicitly tell you the kinds of rules to use. Terry Knight has taken that method and elaborated and has used it for uh, architectural education. Uh, I use them for many reasons, actually. I use them as a way to teach shape grammars and um, a computational process of design. I use them for historical reasons because they're connected with Frank Lloyd Wright and with the modern movement in general. And I use them for practical reasons because they're small and they're easy to handle and they feel good. So I use them for sensory reasons as well. I think by manipulating the system and by manipulating the blocks and by looking at what you get, you really get some really crucial insights into what's going on when you design something. And it's really powerful right from the start. If you take one block and say, I've got one block, you can explore that and say, well, okay, we can get bored with that. And as soon as you have two, the world changes. If you have one block and you have another block, how are those blocks related? Well, there's a million ways. Like, well, they could touch. You could have face to face, you could have edge to edge, you could have a space between them. You could have a little more space between them, a little more space. When do you get to the point where they're not related anymore? You have to know that. Now, when you know that, you're ready for the next. And everything builds from there. And I would say there's no more magic than that in everything we do. Once you did that, you got these things that, that I call spatial relations, and then a spatial relation was two blocks. And then you could look at that relation and get a rule because you could take one piece of the relation and let that be the left-hand side of the rule and the other two be the right-hand side of the rule and you were calculating. I mean, you were off and running, you'd calculate anything in the universe using that idea. So I started out using them to teach students basic mathematical um, ideas about forms in 3D. We talk about symmetry and we talk about proportion because many of them are so used to modeling stuff on the computer. They're not used to actually dealing with real, <laughs> real forms. So they quickly discover that they really don't know as much about spatial form as they thought they did. And um, we're talking about architects. Um, and so they're surprised and somewhat embarrassed sometimes that they don't recognize the same form from different angles, let's say. Now we're talking about the third block. We have two blocks. We bring in the third block. Once you bring in the third block, wherever you place that third block relative to the first two, sets a pattern forever for everything else. Sacred geometry starts with a third piece. Once you have that third object, balance, harmony, all the things that we talk about that we see in nature and we want in our designs, depending on where we place that, that third block, is it in harmony, is it in balance? There's only so many places it can be. It's informed by the blocks themselves as, as opposed to some conceptual idea about what beauty is, is, is. And by doing that in a rigorous sort of way, I don't think it, it, it stunts creativity in the least. It just opens everything up and gives you a vast array of possibilities that um, weren't there before. And they're always like completely stunned that they can make these really interesting spatial objects with oblongs and pillars. Um, so that's why I like to use simple forms. I'm constantly telling them you don't have to start out with complexity. You can start out with simple forms 
simple physical forms and generate some really cool spatial ideas from them. As you're doing it, you don't need to know what you're doing. And I think one of the definitions of design that I use a lot is making things when you don't know what you're doing and changing your mind and switching your goals and doing all sorts of things that sound irrational and sound chaotic and sound like a mess. But at the end of the day, you come up with a design that could be quite valuable and, and quite exciting. And if you were to ask me, did the designer or did I know what I was doing? I'd answer yes, but not in a, a, a linear sequential way that um, most people would call knowing what you're doing. And so through these sets, they're able to understand nature in a, in a new way, a nature of, of possibility, in some cases collision and contradiction, but it's the sets that allow them to express these abstract relationships in a very vivid way. The gifts are really ingenious when you look at them. I mean, the way the system works and the way the pieces go together and the kinds of things that you can get with simple finger and thumb spatial relations. The thing nowadays is people are realizing how important free play is. In other words, like play without any outcome um, prescribed at the beginning of it. And, and that free play is the same as the design process. And then from, from this, they develop more complex um, spatial forms in relation to some kind of program or some uh, categories, like categ for its use, Froebel's categories, categories of life. They might be real life things, they might have to do with forms of beauty, just like an, originally Froebel's method was to introduce the blocks in conjunction with those categories. I do pretty much the same thing when I think about it. It really is the same idea. Many of the things that they do in the, in the media lab with um, um, the lifelong kindergarten that are based on kind of putting things together that are essentially combinatorial. It's a hugely powerful idea. And it's one that I think, uh, at least from my point of view, animates 99% of what goes on at MIT. I really wonder what Froebel would think about the Media Lab. Why am I at the Media Lab talking about the Froebel blocks? I call my research group here at the MIT Media Lab the Lifelong Kindergarten Group, because I've always been inspired by the way children learn in kindergarten. Even though kindergarten was invented nearly 200 years ago, to me it feels like it's the perfect approach for today's society. Because we need young people to grow up to become creative thinkers. And I think the classic kindergarten approach puts young people on a path to be developing as creative thinkers. We have to use all our blocks, remember? Froebel's blocks are kind of a DNA of a wonderful world of design. It's all part and parcel of the same kind of enterprise. It's encouraging people to use their hands and use their eyes to design stuff and um, keeping it grounded in these wonderful gifts. And they are wonderful <laughs> gifts. What is real common in all universities today is how do we teach critical thinking? And that's what's happening with the Foible methods. They let you do just a host of things. They let you explore yourself as yourself and that it's only when um, kindergarten instruction, if that makes any sense, tries to narrow it down so that you build things in a certain way or construct things in a certain way that um, I think it diminishes what kids can do and where they can go and what they're learning by manipulating things with their eyes and their hands. It's the same work whether they're three or whether they're 18. From my perspective, the tragedy is that they haven't been doing it since they were three. There's no reason not to.